we are honored to introduce Patricia Whitelock. Um, and Patricia, I will um, give you a heads up two minutes before the end of your talk. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to focus on the asymptotic giant branch because I've only got 15 minutes and particularly on the large amplitude variable uh, high mass loss phase that these stars go through at the end of the AGB and just remind you that this is when uh, low mass stars are their most luminous and in distant but resolved populations, these may be the only stars that we can see. Now we've heard uh, over the last few days how mass loss drives AGB evolution, but how we don't fully understand the convection pulsation magnetic fields that drive the mass loss. So I touch briefly on this, on dust formation, uh, and the dependence of all these things on comp composition. I do want to mention binaries. I think this is particularly important uh, and very important not to forget. I also want to touch briefly on the somewhat more massive hot bottom burning stars, the super AGB stars. And if there's time to mention uh, AGB and giant branch stars as extra galactic probes for the distance scale. So mass loss, uh, we don't understand it in any detail. We, the conventional picture, of course, is that pulsation levitates the atmosphere, dust condenses, radiation pushes the dust away. Uh, and we certainly have lots of observational evidence of this. The biggest amplitude pulsators are the heaviest mass loss stars. Uh, and there's many very neat models. Uh, I particularly mention those from Susanna Hofner and colleagues because they've had the courage to do detailed comparison with observations of both carbon and oxygen rich stars. But there's a lot to be done yet in terms of exploring the grain chemistry and further comparison with our observations. What's the role of convection? Can you have a pulsation without convection? Uh, is convection sometimes enough to drive mass loss? And let me just highlight this, which is one of pictures which we're increasingly seeing, uh, reconstructions of what the stellar surface of an AGB star looks like, the very large convection cells, uh, and ask the question whether it's really possible to do anything meaningful without three three-dimensional models. Uh, also for my own benefit, I, I'm puzzled that so many theorists still use either the Reimers or the Vasiliadis and Wood um, prescriptions for mass loss, despite all the work that's been done in intervening time. Perhaps somebody can tell me that. Okay, pulsation, mass loss, step one. We've learned a great deal about pulsation over the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, we've seen this diagram earlier, it's the um, uh, period luminosity relation from the LMC. Um, originally, uh, Peter Wood uh, identified that these sequences represented overtone and fundamental pulsation in AGB and giant branch stars. Uh, more recently, Michael Trebuchi and colleagues have modeled very well, that's what we can see on the, the right-hand side, the overtone pulsators. Uh, and very recently, last year, he and colleagues have, have managed to reproduce uh, sequence C, the fundamental uh, um, vibration mode with uh, nonlinear models. I'm not illustrating that, it's, it's a bit too complex. But this is a great start to understanding pulsation, particularly of low or moderately mass loss stars, of low mass uh, stars, that is, and those with moderate mass losses. But what about the higher mass stars? And what's the role of turbulent viscosity, dust, chemical composition on this? And what actually drives pulsation? Is it convection? Uh, can you get pulsation without convection? Does the Kappa mechanism so important in our Alaris and Cephes play any role at all? It would be wonderful if we could get to a stage where we could predict periods of luminosities as a function of age, metallicity, and so on. It would be, provide us with a wonderful tool for probing resolved cellar populations. Now, mass loss step two is the formation of dust. 
presumably preceded by molecules. And we have wonderful evidence of very large numbers of, of increasingly complex mo molecules over the last decade, particularly from Alma and, and Herschel. Um, we also have, but, but we very far work from, from understanding how the dust actually condenses from this molecules, but making progress. Uh, the chemistry is complex, as we've heard in previous talks. The lack of laboratory data is, is a, a stumbling block. It's certainly encouraging to see the detection of oxygen rich molecules in carbon rich stars and carbon rich molecules in oxygen rich stars, providing us with evidence of shock chemistry uh, and more insight into the complexity of this region where the dust must be formed. Uh, we don't know the, the uh, grain size distribution or how things change as the grains gradually move away from the star. There's certainly potential for mapping in detail what happens around pulsation cycles as the dust is formed and destroyed. I want to go back briefly to uh, this diagram I showed earlier that we've seen many times. You, you will recall A, B and C are the overtone pulsators. Uh, C is the uh, fundamental vibration rotation, the, fu sorry, the fundamental uh, pulsation mode. The other sequences over here remained a mystery for some while. We now understand that sequence E is ellipsoidal pulsations and sequence D remained a mystery uh, until earlier this year. Sequence D is the long secondary periods because many of the stars in this region also show overtone pulsation. Uh, we've heard something about this already, uh, but it certainly impressed me greatly. Um, and I point you to, to Igor Szynski's talk, five minute talk. Uh, without going into this in any more detail, uh, they've demonstrated that the long secondary periods in these stars are caused by eclipses, by planets. The planets have grown by accreting mass from the AGB giant branch star, uh, and in some cases grown to brown dwarf size. Now, as usual, when you solve a, a long-standing mystery, it actually opens the door on many new mysteries, and it certainly asks the question, uh, what's the importance of the planets that are already being consumed to the chemistry mixing and evolution of these stars? And it makes me wonder if any star can really be considered single throughout its evolution. Uh, now, we have seen this, these images numerous times. I'm not apologizing to showing them again. From the very early ALMA observations of the carbon rich semi regular variable and the beautiful spiral obviously created by, by binary interaction to the many more images of uh, oxygen rich Miro variables uh, of, of the kind shown here. These will help us understand the morphology of planetary nebulae, but they also kill the myth that, that complex planetaries were born from totally symmetric um, AGB stars. Um, I'm, no, I'm not going to say anything about magnetic fields. They're clearly important, but I don't think I've really got anything to add to what has already been said on this subject. Let me move on to intermediate mass stars. Um, in intermediate mass stars, uh, it's possible under certain circumstances for the hydrogen envelope to dip into the hydrogen burning zone with far reaching consequences for the star. First of all, it provides extra hydrogen fuel for burning, so it increases the luminosity above the traditional core mass luminosity relation limits and takes the AGB stars into the supergiant uh, regime. It affects the abundances, and perhaps the most important thing is that carbon burns to nitrogen. So uh, despite the dredge up, these stars don't turn into to carbon stars. And there's been a lot of work over the last few years on hot bottom burning theory. Uh, it certainly appears that it starts earlier at, uh, at much lower mass, at lower metallicity. And this means it's probably important in the early universe, uh, relatively low metallicity stars. 
But the details are strongly dependent on the particular theory, as was mentioned in the earlier discussion today. Strong mass loss inhibits hot bottom burning. Uh, and the uh, adopted mixing by the theorists and the burning mixing interaction is crucial in deciding what actually happens. Observationally, we see hot bottom burning stars in various ways. This is a K period luminosity relation for the uh, LMC, uh, blue or oxygen rich stars. Short period stars are uh, at the tip of their asymptotic giant branch, uh, low mass stars, uh, and they form on the period luminosity relation, as in fact do the carbon stars when you correct, cor correct them for the dust obscuration. Longer period higher mass stars lie above this relation, presumably because of the extra luminosity from the extra hydrogen. Uh, and we have yet to map out exactly what they do as they evolve. Um, hot bottom burning stars are found, as I said, more commonly in low metallicity. So we find them in local group dwarf irregulars. There's an example here from IC1613, just four hot bottom burning stars, large amplitude, almost a magnitude pulsation amplitude at K. This is K, J minus K, periods over 460 days and neatly fitted by these isochrones from Marigo et al. With uh, uh, probably with masses round about, initial masses round about three and a half solar masses. Likewise in the Sagittarius dwarf irregular, um, we see very few uh, of these, in fact, just one uh, blue star here. This blue point is a uh, hot bottom burning star. It has a period of a thousand days and it fits very nicely on the evolutionary track, parsec calibri evolutionary tracks. Um, K magnitude of minus 10. This made me rather surprised to see this recent uh, paper by O'Grady et al, and, and she has a talk at this, this meeting, very interesting talk describing super AGB stars, but she's suggesting that the equivalent stars in the SMC and in the LMC are actually super AGB stars. Um, I, it, if she's correct, I do wonder what's happened to the three, four, five solar mass stars, but I guess this is a, an example of the kind of difference that you get using different theories. Super AGB stars are extremely interesting. Uh, so they're stars which undergo carbon burning prior to their thermal pulsing. Mass range depends extremely on the metallicity, could be anywhere between six and 12 solar masses. They may be, the at least some of them, the progenitors of electron capture supernovae and they have interesting abundance anomalies. They have similar luminosities to supergiants, but large amplitude, perhaps Myra-like pulsations. And there are a couple of very good candidates in, in the SMC. Uh, very recently, it has been suggested that VX uh, Sagittarii, it, the SRC galactic variable, is also a super AGB, and there's a talk about that uh, in the contributed talks as well. I think the argument for that is good. Uh, it doesn't have Myra-like pulsations, but it does have very large amplitude variable variability. What's certain is that, that these stars, assuming they exist, will be among the brightest large amplitude variables found in nearby galaxies by uh, Rubin telescope, the LSST with the Rubin telescope. And they will very probably be bright in JWST because of the heavy mass loss. Patricia, we you certainly you see some, me? yeah. We see some examples here it, detected by the spirits collaboration in their search for uh, transients. These were the byproduct of variables at 4.5 microns function of period. These are like the uh, shorter period ordinary Myras that you find in local group dwarfs. And these are in slightly more distant spiral galaxies. Uh, periods over a thousand days, uh, comparable to the OHIR stars and perhaps to this star, which is one of the um, uh, super AGB candidates. Um, 
just briefly to mention the potential uh, of AGB stars and giant branches, extra galactic distance indicators. There's been a revival of interest in the Hubble constant because of the apparent tension between measurements with of the cosmic microwave background uh, and the supernova expansion rate. So there's a big interest in how you can calibrate the supernova. Uh, tip of the red giant branches used short period Myras uh, have been used. And there's the new method of, of using carbon stars in the limited J minus K range. Uh, it will be interesting to see how this develops. And it will be interesting to see if there's any potential in these very long period, very massive stars that have periods up to two or 3000 uh, days. Thank you very much. Great, thank you.